Good afternoon, or whenever you are watching this, and welcome to Worship on the Water, Sundays at 6, our weekly worship gathering. This week, due to cold temperatures, we won't be gathering in person. We also aren't meeting today in person because of our community Martin Luther King interfaith worship service, which is going to be held today at 4 p.m. on Zoom. And so we invite you, if you're watching this video before 4 p.m., if you'd like to click over to that. The link is found in our weekly e-blast, or you can also find that on our social media pages. And now I invite you to maybe text take a moment to text a neighbor, may the peace of Christ be with you. And let us pray. O Lord, who calls us to follow even when it is costly. O God, who calls us to love even when hate or sometimes indifference seem to have a stronger voice. O God, who calls us to work for peace, peace that is not an absence of tension, but a presence of justice for all your children. Speak to us now. We pray, God, that you would make us people of peace, that you would make our nation a nation of peace with justice, that you would make our homes our churches, our communities, our schools, and yes, even our nation, a place of peace, that violence would end, and that your way of love would be known throughout the entire earth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord from Mark chapter 1. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed Jesus. As Jesus went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks.
grace and peace to you. I am missing you all being here. We still have our journey to the manger animal cutouts in the back of the sanctuary. And even though it's kind of funny to preach to cows and donkeys and sheep, it's not the same as seeing your faces. We want to continue to lift up this week and the next few weeks, Pastor Doug Lane, our senior pastor, who is away on a well-needed sabbatical. It's four weeks and it is a well-deserved and needed time of rest, but also renewal and learning so that he can come back to lead our congregation with new ideas and new vigor and new life through this really challenging season. We know it is a scary time and a chaotic time for all of us. And so we ask that you continue to keep our church in your prayers, that you continue to keep Pastor Doug in your prayers and all the rest of us staff as we, as we work together to continue the ministry of Wrightsville along with all of you. Would you pray with me? O oh Lord who calls us just as you called those first disciples by the lake shore. O oh Lord, you ask us to lay down our nets, maybe not literal nets, but the things that we have so that we can follow you and seek your kingdom. Speak to us, God, be in our speaking and in our listening. And may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It kind of looked like Jesus, kind of. In a way that my stick figure drawings kind of look like a Picasso. In a way that the cake I made on Christmas kind of looks like the showstoppers from the Great British Baking Show. It kind of looked like Jesus. The church in Spain, the Sanctuary of Mercy Church in Borja, Spain, had a fresco a fresco of Jesus that had been painted about 1930 by the Spanish painter Elias Garcia Martinez. I am, have deplorable Spanish, forgive me for that. It was a beautiful painting of Jesus, a fresco called Behold the Man that showed Jesus with a crown of thorns on his head. The painting was getting a little bit old and so someone with, you know, best intentions at heart had decided to update it a little bit. Um, maybe give it a little spruce up, renovate it, restore it, so to speak. This painting went viral a couple years ago. I'm not sure if you have seen it, but you can Google Eke Homo, which means behold the man painting Spain. And you'll find, probably see the um, attempts of an elderly parishioner named Cecilia, who has about the same artistic ability as I do. She said, according to good old Wikipedia, that she was upset that parts of the picture of Jesus had flaked off. There was moisture on the church walls, something that we can understand being at a beach church. And so she said, I can't understand the uproar. I was just trying to, I've never tried to do anything to harm the church. Jesus, however, though, in this restoration, looked a little bit more like, an animal than like the Son of God. I remember laughing at this restoration. <laughs> As I researched this this week, I saw an article from 2012 that said, woman who ruined fresco of Jesus now wants to be paid, in which she, <laughs> good old Cecilia, asked for a bit, you know, just her share of the 2,000 euros or so, about 2,600 US dollars at the time, that Taurus had given to the church to see the restored artwork. <laughs> it kind of looked like Jesus, but it wasn't really him. All art aside, I wonder if you have ever been mistaken for somebody else. I've been told that I have one of those faces that looks familiar. I'm not quite sure what that means, <laughs> but folks have said, you look like this person or this person. Maybe it's just a conversation starter. Hopefully, I don't look like the ruined, restored painting of Jesus on that Spanish church wall. 
Honestly, we don't really know what Jesus looked like. <laughs> he probably looked um, uh, dark skinned. He probably was maybe a little bit crazy haired for a homeless rabbi in the Middle East. The scripture says that Jesus had nothing of beauty to draw us to him. And so who knows what James and John and Peter and Andrew and all of the disciples in Galilee saw when they looked at this man who came and asked them to put down their fishing equipment, the tools of their job, the way that they made their money, and to follow him. It's kind of an audacious request, really. He came from Nazareth, Scripture says. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nazareth, a town that might have had a Walmart or a couple dollar generals, a strip mall with some stores, possibly a Target, maybe a little bit like my hometown of Huntington, West Virginia. But it was not a fresh market or Trader Joe's kind of town, definitely not a Whole Foods kind of town. Jesus maybe talked with that Galilee accent, and he sure wasn't one of the priestly class, not even a Pharisee that taught in the synagogues. He might have been one of those guys that had the stink on him of being conceived by an unwed mother and probably did not look like the paintings of him, even the beautiful ones made by our artists. Who knows what he looked like? Who knows what they saw? As I have read this scripture in the past and as I was uh, thinking and praying about what God has for us this week, I was thinking about how often when I read this scripture, I think about James and John, <laughs> Peter and Andrew laying down their nets and not the simple action, the simple command, follow me. I always place the emphasis on follow, the verb, right? That's the action word. But I don't really place the emphasis on that simple two-letter word, me. Follow me. I've been thinking this week that we are people that are made to follow. <laughs> some of us are called to be leaders, and some of us, all of us, are called to be followers of Jesus. But we all follow something, don't we? <laughs> I think about a quote from some of the reformers in um, the 15th and 16th and 17th century. They talk about our hearts being made for worship and that if we don't worship God, God as God is, then we'll find something else to do that. We'll find community. We'll find something that desires and requires sacrifice of it. If we don't have a capital G God to follow, we will follow a little G God, whether that's ourselves or someone else. Jesus is Lord is a phrase that we say often. And I think sometimes we just think that this is a, a phrase to say, but Jesus is Lord means that all of the other would-be lords, all the other would-be kings are not. <laughs> Jesus calls us. To follow, yes, but not to follow just anyone, not to follow just anything, not to follow a political leader or ideology, not to follow, um, you know, our sports teams, not to follow people that look like us or think like us, but to follow Jesus, even when it does not seem easy or comfortable. Our following of Jesus means necessarily that sometimes our paths are going to converge from some of the other things, some of the other ways that we might want to follow. Follow me. Lay down your nets. This weekend, we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day, this, this Monday, in fact. This day is often uh, set apart in the United Methodist Church and other churches to think about humans and how we relate to each other. Um, how we build what King called the beloved community across lines of race and gender and sexual orientation and disability and wealth and poverty and all sorts of other things. It's a celebration. But this year, at least on Wednesday as we are recording this, me and Pastor Hope and Ryan Mansbury in our sanctuary, I don't know if it feels like a celebration, not for me at least. 
I don't know about you, but this week I feel called to remember and called to repent. In his very last book he wrote before he was murdered by a white supremacist in Memphis, Tennessee, King asked this question that became the title of his last book. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? It was 1967, and at the time it was a real question, and it feels like a real question in 2021 too. It's a question I've been asking over and over this long, long week. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? It's January in the middle of a COVID winter where women are losing jobs and dropping out of the workforce to Zoom school or homeschool their children, where vaccines are coming and we are seeing progress, thank God, but it doesn't seem soon enough, where we are still preaching and praying to cameras and at the park and to donkey and sheep cutouts in the back of the church, where a couple weeks ago, AME and United Methodist pastors in Washington, D.C., watched as church banners in support of peace and racial justice on their church steps were burned in broad daylight uh, right there on the steps of the church by white supremacist groups. And as we record this on Wednesday, it's about a week after an attack on the U.S. Capitol where I saw a giant wooden cross stand next to a giant noose and gallows in sight of where I went on a middle school trip. As the hymn goes, as the spiritual goes, we are tired, we are weak, we are worn. How long, O oh Lord, I keep asking. <laughs> and then that question again and again, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Where do we go from here? I was asking myself and Jesus and friends this week. Good thing the senior pastor is gone, the one who's used to doing the heavy lifting and you get the associate. What on earth can you say? And then someone put a book in my box that I had been meaning to read. Love is the way it's titled in this blue and pink cover. And the subtitle is this, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times. It's written by Bishop Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of our brothers and sisters in the Episcopal Church. Maybe Bishop Curry is best known not for this book or for that title, but for giving the beautiful wedding sermon at the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. I don't know if you follow the royals as I do, but maybe you've heard of him and you can Google that sermon. Love often turns the world upside down, Bishop Curry writes, and I'm only about 25 pages in. But he describes to us a different kind of love, not just love that is sentimental, but love that is mobilized. <laughs> I love that. Love that puts its boots on, and love that turns the world upside down. Bishop Curry says there is a problem when love becomes a mere sentiment. Love, the nice feeling that rises up inside us, becomes love the sedative. It's a sweet thing that leaves us complacent and sleepy. No, the love I'm asking you to discover inside yourself or reconnect to is something fierce. This love is a verb, it's an action with force and follow through. When we pull love out of the abstract, when we really put it to work, it starts to reveal its extraordinary power. Love is an action. It's the only thing that has ever changed the world for the better. This simple act of love <laughs> delivered right to my box at the right time with a monogrammed note on stationery saying, I'm praying for you, was, I think, a word from God. Dr. King wrote in that book, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice as it, at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. I love that. Love correcting everything that stands against love. Isn't that a description of Jesus? <laughs> Isn't that a painting more beautiful than any painting or stained glass or any description of Jesus that we have ever seen, any fresco in any church? Isn't that Jesus? Correcting everything that stands against love, not just through words, although Jesus did that. Jesus spoke truth that is often hard for us to hear but needed for our souls. 
but Jesus was love embodied, love in a person. And when we follow Jesus, we are that stubborn, resilient, self-giving, self-sacrificing kind of love. That love that might look reckless in the sight of the world. That love that might feel risky to us. That love that might look honestly pointless sometimes, that might feel pointless in the face of hatred or selfishness or danger. Friends, this week I was asking, where do we go from here? I'm not sure myself, a person who has um, way too much food to eat, to be honest, a nice house to lay my head on, um, white skin, and who has had the opportunity uh, beyond what I could have ever dreamed in my life. I'm not sure I'm the one to answer that question. But this week, love said to me, Jesus said to me, and I believe love wants to say to us, love said, like those disciples, lay down your nets and follow. Follow me. Lay down. One word that we use sometimes is self-giving, self-sacrifice. Sometimes what we are called to do is to repent to look within ourselves, within the comforting, loving presence of the Holy Spirit and say, what is it in me that needs to die so that you and your love can live in and through me? Love said to me, lay down. Lay down what you think you are entitled to. Lay down your need to be right. Lay down your need to prove yourself right. Lay down your righteous anger that can become self-righteous anger in a hot New York minute. Love said to me, lay down your need to be number one. Lay down your need to have all the right words to say. Lay down your need to read 500 more articles and 500 more books, to have 500 more meetings, or write 500 more words before you do, do the hard work of love. Love said to me, Lay down your need to have 10 years more of experience or to follow me the way somebody else does it. Love said, lay down your need not to be like those Christians or those people or those pastors or those white folks because, my child, you have sins and prejudices and blind spots too. Let's find them together. Let's heal them together. I have good work for you to do. But first, you have to lay it down. Lay it down. Lay down your desire to be liked or have peace at all costs, even if it means going along with what is wrong. Lay that down. Lay down your need to be right and learn with me how to say this, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Thank you for teaching me. Love says, learn how to respond gently but firmly. Maybe you can say, I don't see the truth in that. But let's have a conversation and maybe let's take that on offline. Learn with me, love says, how to say this. I repent, I am sorry. Lay it all down, lay it down. Everything except for me, everything except for love. And follow, follow me. Friends, Bishop Curry um, gives us a story, <laughs> stories of what love looks like. And I wanna close with this one. He lifts up the story of um, a civil rights leader whose name is kind of forgotten. <laughs> Oftentimes, the folks that we lift up, Dr. King and Rosa Parks, I think we lift up and maybe we forget the stories of others. And so maybe part of that renovation work, that excavation work, is just to take off the paint that obscures the real truth about things and see all of the folks who have done the hard, inglorious work of love. Love, Bishop Curry writes, is people like Fannie Lou Hamer, a civil rights pioneer whose contribution to the movement um, was honored on the floor of our Congress in 2017 on the 100th anniversary of her birth. Fannie was born in 1917, one of 20 children her parents were two sharecroppers who at the time were de facto slaves. They were desperately poor. Fanny had polio, but walking with a limp didn't stop her from having to pick cotton, so much cotton in her teens. 
She dropped out of school to help her aging parents pick more cotton because that's what a sister does when the family has 19 other siblings to feed. In 1961, Fanny went to a Sunflower County Hospital in Mississippi for a minor surgery and left and was sterilized, given a hysterectomy without her consent. Like so many other black or brown women at the time have been throughout history. A side note, Fanny later adopted and raised children of her own. Some people would have given up on that point, Bishop Curry writes, deciding that any society that would condone such a crime was irrevocably evil. But not Fanny. She was just getting started. Because one year later, she learned something she hadn't heard before. Black folks had the right to register and vote in the United States. And when she tried to do it in Ruleville, Mississippi, she failed the literacy test, one of the ways that whites have prevented blacks from exercising their rights in our history. After that day, she never tired in her fight to right that wrong, surviving a gunshot from the KKK and being put, beaten by police in prison. And despite the treatment she experienced at the hands of whites, she never once backed down from that vision of a movement that had at its conclusion, all good people living together as brothers and sisters, sharing the same welcoming table. This is love. Love standing against correcting everything that stands against love. And so friends, today you are called to follow. I am called to follow, but not just anyone and not just any Jesus, but the real Jesus, the Jesus of Fannie Lou Hamer, the Jesus that Bishop Curry points us to, the Jesus that called Simon and his brother Andrew, that called James and his brother John, and who calls all of us, even now, even today. Amen. Father, who art in heaven, sia santificato il tuo nome. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Friends, I don't know what layers of paint have obscured that picture of Jesus maybe in your mind, that love made flesh that Jesus is. And I don't know what Jesus is calling you to lay down, but I do know this, that Jesus always gives us a choice to follow him and to do the hard work of love, correcting everything that stands against love. I know this, that our lives through the work of the Spirit is the answer to the question, where do we go from here? <laughs> we are called to turn away from chaos and selfishness and hatred, racism and sexism, white supremacy, all of those things that stand against the work of Jesus. And we are called to do that sometimes boring and always wonderful work of community. Jesus has never forced me to follow him, but Jesus is calling us. The, the real Jesus, not Jesus who just blesses all of our preferences and hatreds and never challenges us and always responds with praise hands to all of our texts, to all of our Instagram stories. That's not Jesus. The Jesus that we follow is not a Jesus that condemns us and says that there is no hope for you either. Jesus is not the Jesus that just kind of says, oh, the world's always going to be this way. People are always going to be people. And this Jesus isn't one that loves us or our family or our country more than anyone else. This Jesus is the Jesus that calls us, the Jesus that gave himself on the cross and the Jesus that asks us to come and follow him. And so this week we are inviting you, our church staff and leadership invite you 
this week to, to do the hard work of love. We are going to be praying as a leadership this coming Tuesday, the day after Martin Luther King Day and the day of our staff meeting. Um, we'll be praying between the 10 and 11 o'clock hour for about 15 minutes, and we invite you to pray with us to pray um, that love would correct everything that stands against love, that to pray for peace with justice in our country and that we would turn toward community, turn towards looking toward the needs of our neighbors and not just towards ourselves, that we would pray that forces of violence would not have the last word, but that peace would reign. And so friends, I also invite you maybe to take about 15 minutes and to go unplug from your phone and Instagram and Facebook and TV and all of the things. Maybe even hide from your family for a hot second, even if you need to. Go, go, go in the shower, go outside in the woods, go somewhere to maybe ask Jesus, what is it that I need to lay down so that I can do the hard work of love? Maybe that's something that is a sin within you that God will point out as God has been doing for me. And maybe it's something that's not, but that you just are being called to lay down. If you need to talk to someone, our pastors and staff, we are here. But most of all, the Jesus of Nazareth, the Jesus who was love correcting everything that stands against it, is with you. Go in peace, friends. Amen.